You're listening to the Heart Lessons Podcast with me, Sarah Ricky. Real women, real stories, real faith. Hi friends, and thank you for joining me for today's episode of the Heart Lessons Podcast. My guest on today's episode is Becky McCoy. Becky is a blogger and a writer, and she has her own podcast called Stories of Unfolding Grace, where she encourages people to share their stories about a difficult time they went through and how the Lord was still faithful to show his grace to them, even in the midst of that trial. As you hear Becky's story, you are going to see that she is well qualified to talk about um, the Lord's unfolding grace during trials as she experienced the loss of her husband um, while she was pregnant with their daughter. And so today you're going to hear about that journey. You're going to hear a little bit about her grief journey and about um, the heart lessons that have that have come out of this experience for her and how she now has a passion for encouraging others to live bravely and authentically in life and in the midst of life's trials. If you are going through a difficult time today, I think Becky's words are going to be a real source of encouragement to you. And so here's my conversation with Becky. All right. Well, thank you for everyone who um, is tuning in to listen to Heart Lessons today. Um, Here on the show, I like to find women who are walking well and what the Lord has for them. And today I have um, Becky McCoy with me. Hi, Becky. Hi there. (laughs) Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, Um, thanks for having me. I'm excited to hear more about your story and share your story. Um, Would you start off by telling everyone a little bit about yourself, like just kind of a brief bio? Who is Becky McCoy? Sure. I live with my two kids. Um, Caleb is three and Levy is one. We live right near the shoreline in Connecticut, which is awesome. Um, we lived here just a little, actually it's, it's, it'll be, um, a year this week. So that's that. Yeah, that's been really cool. I, um, I write and I have a podcast and, I enjoy laughing and cooking good food and going on adventures. <laughs> well, congrats <laughs> on your uh, one-year house anniversary. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, thanks. We moved about a year ago as well. It'll be a year in September, and so like we're okay. coming up on one year in our new house as well. And uh-huh. I don't know. Did you get? Are you settled? Do you feel settled? Like I still, I feel like yeah, people ask me, and I'm we like, we're I don't know. in the military. <laughs> okay, uh, this is our first like move post the military. So it, I was just kind of in the habit of like get as much set up as quickly as possible so okay. that it feels like home as soon as possible. That's really smart. Um, so I did that except this time it was like, well, we get to live here long term. So I really get to put everything on the walls and paint and like do all this fun stuff. So that's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Um, I, I don't feel like that. We actually, we were in our other house for almost eight years. <laughs> oh, wow. And um, so that, like, totally felt like I had all the paint colors, all the stuff on the wall. It felt like yeah. that definitely felt home. And then we moved, and, like, our house, If I don't know if upsize is a is a phrase, is a real word, but, like, <laughs> we went from, like, a like apartment-sized small house to, like, a pretty a big house. house. Yeah, with, like, three stories. And so I am, like, I don't even know. We, we have, like, empty rooms, and it does not feel yeah. very homey, but working yes. on it working on it yeah so um anyway so you have a podcast called stories and Un- stories of unfolding grace is that right yes yeah that's um it. so will you tell me a little bit about your podcast and your mission and vision for it um so it's called stories of unfolding grace in the message translation of second corinthians four sixteen, it talks about how we can't give up because even though everything in life is falling apart God is making new life on the inside with his unfolding grace. And so I just really wanted to help people share their stories of unfolding grace, of of those really difficult hard seasons in life when good things still happened and how um, maybe that season isn't over for them yet, but it's getting closer and they can see hope now, or maybe that season has already passed and what got them through it and all the ways that grace showed up, um, outside of it. And it's been really, really amazing to help. I mean, really, I'm just giving people an opportunity to share their stories and to see everyone else responding. And there's an episode, um, 
where my mom shares about when my parents had to declare bankruptcy when I was really little. And just the outpouring of, oh my gosh, those are the feelings that I felt when I had to leave my dream job or when, you know, X, Y, Z happened. That's a completely different circumstance. So it's really neat to see this community building around um, just different types of loss and hardship. Yeah. And then it makes you feel less alone. That's I just think that's so powerful. Yeah, totally. When you say like, yeah, like you said, that was me too. I feel like that too. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's just so powerful. Yeah. Um, And then you have a blog as well. It says on your blog that you have a passion for living bravely and authentically. Uh And I am going to go out on a limb here and say that was born out of your own story of adversity, um, and living bravely and authentically through that. So, um, would you share with me about the journey that you were on with your husband and, Uh um, and what happened and, you know, just the story that you guys endured together? Yeah. Yeah. So it's been about 10 or 11 years of God shaping my heart to have this passion about living bravely and authentically. Um, but kind of the catalyst to really write about it and be, so encouraging of other people to live that way too. Um, my husband was sick in 2014 and he had had cancer with the year we were engaged in 2007. Um, and then it had gone away and he was in remission. And then in the fall of 2014, do you mind me asking what kind of, what kind of cancer he had? So the first time it was called large cell anaplastic lymphoma or anaplastic large cell lymphoma. I can never like get the order right. (laughs) Something. One of them, it's a lymphoma that's relatively common in young men, Okay. Um, and it's very treatable and very curable, and he went into remission within, like, I think it was eight or nine months okay. of diagnosis. Yeah. Um, so it's still terrifying, but turned out all right. Yeah. Um, then the fall of 2014, he started waking up completely drenched in sweat, so, like, I mean, the only way I can think of describing it, the only way I describe it to people is like you just got out of a swimming pool or the shower. Like Mm -hmm. you are soaking wet and it's just from sleeping. Um, And so night sweats like that are just never a good symptom. So I knew something was really bad. Uh, He wanted, he was a family physician. So as most physicians, he was a terrible patient and (laughs) was in (laughs) total denial and avoided talking to anybody about it. For a little while, but then I kind of, like, kicked him in the pants, and um, he started getting all the testing and everything done, and um, it it turned out that he had a different cancer, and this one was not treatable and not curable. Um, Yeah, so that was kind of complicated by the fact that our son had just turned two, and I was pregnant with our daughter. Um. And now we're thinking, okay, you know, some people have lived as long as two years. We're thinking, we're hoping you get a whole year, but we just don't know yeah. what's going to happen. And so we we spent the whole month of December having re- in 2014 having really difficult conversations about, okay, what are the kids and I going to do when you're gone? Am I going to need to work? What are our finances going to look like? Are we going to move back to Connecticut? Because at this point in time, he was stationed outside of Washington, D.C. Okay. Um, And so we're just kind of talking through all these things so that we can get them out of the way and then just enjoy whatever time we have left together. Um, And it ended up being God's providence that we had those conversations because he passed away on January 5th. Wow. Um. Yeah, it was just this, like, incredibly intense three months that I feel like it's a movie. Mm. I mean, it's not because I lived it, (laughs) but in my head, it's like this super dramatic Lifetime movie. Yeah. Um, That It's hard to believe that that really happened. Um, So I was still eight months pregnant with our daughter when he passed away. And, yeah, yeah, it has been... A journey. So what was it like having those conversations of, you know, what are we going to do if you're not here? When, am mm-hmm. I going to work? Like, what was that like? How did you work through that emotionally? What were your thoughts like towards the Lord during that time? 
Yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I'm not going to try and <laughs> sugarcoat it. No, it was horrible. I, yeah. It was so hard. You know, I mean, you don't, he was 32 when he passed away. Like, nobody wants to have those conversations before you're like 80 or 90 something years right. old. Like, um, but we had watched my parents walk through the same thing. My dad had passed away. Um, to two years earlier. Okay. Um, and we had seen them make those choices and we had seen other couples that we had seen walk through this, make different choices. And so kind of not purposefully, we, the last several years before he got sick again, had been saying like, Oh, well, if we ever have to deal with this, you know, this is what we want to do. And this is what we want to talk about. And this is what we want to be open about. Um, and so it wasn't easy. And there was one like 40, 24, 48 hour period where I think I was just like sobbing the mm. whole time yeah. because it was just the weight of it. Like I'm about to be a single parent. Yeah. And he never like looked like a cancer patient. So it was really strange because there was never that moment where he looked like he was going to die. Um, because maybe he didn't have to go through chemo. Do you think that might've been? Yeah. Well, he passed away before he, like he had a chemo port put in, but he, he was, he passed away the day he was supposed to start chemo. Oh, wow. Which again, being a physician, like that was such a gift from God that he didn't have to do any treatments because he really didn't want to. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, those, those conversations were terrible, but it was such a gift because, when he did pass away, then I kind of, I had less decisions to make. Right. Um, on your own. Cause when, yeah. When your spouse passes away, you have a lot of decisions to make, like things you can't even like think of ahead of time. Um, so much paperwork to fill out. Like it's ridiculous. You're, you're in this moment of complete shock and stress and then people keep handing you paperwork mm. to fill out. <laughs> like, <laughs> You're like, no, thank you. Can I, can I please not right now? Yeah. And so like that whole, like it was for a good, like two weeks after he passed away that I just felt like I was doing paperwork all the time. Oh my. Um, so to just be able to sit there and like sign my name or like, <laughs> you know, make silly decisions like which bank account that life insurance should go to or things like that, yeah. but not have to think, okay, do I need to start applying to jobs where the kids and I going to live? Like, to not have to think through that stuff was just such a gift. Mm. It was amazing. Yeah. So that's one of your uh, unfolding grace. Uh, one yeah. of your One of your pieces of unfolding grace is just that you had that, that blessing of like, at least you didn't have to make those big decisions on your own. No. And because we had those conversations, we had closure. Like yeah. in, the, in the last moments of his life, like he – he knew he had a lot of kinesthetic awareness. So he like knew his body really well. And Mm -hmm. being a physician, he knew exactly what was going on in his body. And he was like, this is it. Like, I can't, I'm, it's time to go to heaven. And, um, and he just looked at me and he said, I'm so sorry. I I don't want to do this to you. And I love you. And, and I almost laughed at him because it was like, dude, we've had these conversations already. Like, yeah. let's just get to it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, and to not have that like panicked feeling of, am I going to get closure was just really, really, it helped it be much more peaceful. Yeah. Wow. More of just a, a like, yeah, like a peaceful transition sort of. Right. Right. Mm. So you said you were eight months pregnant with your daughter when, yeah. um, when your husband <laughs> passed away, which yeah. is just crazy. I take it that your husband was present when your son was born. and Yeah, so <laughs> that's a funny story. So yeah, my <laughs> husband was with me when Caleb was born, but my dad passed away eight hours later. Oh my word. So I had a lot of PTSD about being pregnant and oh. giving birth. Um, because my dad had been so sick while I was pregnant and I was terrified to get pregnant again, because what if somebody else gets sick and dies? And so when I did get pregnant, 
Keith was like, don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. You don't have to worry about me. And so then when we realized how sick he was, he was like, ooh, sorry. Yeah. Like, okay, well, it's not like you had any control over that. So, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was so hard. Um, there was one moment I ended up having a C-section with both of my kids. Um, and so when, with Libby, when I was in labor and walking into the OR and sitting down on the table, I just completely lost it. And the anesthesiologist was trying to be so kind. And he just said, you know, it's not that big of a needle. It's just a spinal And he was really lucky that I was in so much pain (laughs) (laughs) because I really would have like wanted to smack him and been like, did you read my chart? My husband just died. Like (laughs) this has nothing to do with the spinal. Like actually the faster you could do it, the better, please. (sighs) Um, But just all those memories of like laboring and knowing that my dad wasn't doing well and having a newborn and losing my dad and then pretty much going through almost the exact same thing all over again was just so incredibly overwhelming. So what was that moment like when you saw your daughter for the first time and you knew that your husband wasn't there to share in that like sweet, sacred, you know, almost blissful moment? What was that like? Um, that whole month between when he passed away and when she was born, I was so angry because I knew we weren't going to have that moment. Yeah. So I feel like I feel like I'd worked through a lot of those uh, negative emotions. Okay. Um, and I knew from my experience with my son that once I got to hold her, um, that there would be a lot of healing that would start in my own heart. Mm. Um. And that's just how it was. She was all bundled up, and my mom was there with me when she was born, and she held her up to my face, and I looked at her, and it just, I, it was like this this moment that things will be okay again. They yeah. don't feel like it right now, but they will. And then she just gave me this stare. We call it her judgy face. She still (laughs) does it. (laughs) Where I almost felt like I needed to give her references and, like, (laughs) promise that I knew how to be a mom and I I have a kid already. (laughs) (laughs) That's really funny. Yeah, like, I felt really confident when my son was born, which is not normal for a first-time mom. But then with this kid, I felt like I needed to justify absolutely everything (laughs) I did. (laughs) You're like, no, seriously, I can do this. I've done it before. Yeah, so she just had me laughing from the very beginning. And she just wanted to snuggle that whole first 24 hours. And she is just the happiest person that you've ever met. That's so sweet. It's it's really incredible. That's so sweet. And her, she has a special name, right? You guys picked you and Keith picked her name um, before. Yeah, you we away. had we had picked her name. Um, I think maybe even before he was sick, and okay. then when he got sick, it was just like. Um, so her name is Elizabeth Grace. We call her Libby, but. Um, Elizabeth, oh, I'm going to forget what it means now that you've asked me. (laughs) Um, It means something like chosen by God or um, just a really, really special name and then grace. And, And I think it's just so amazing because that's exactly who she is. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's really neat. That's so sweet. So your postpartum recovery, you had a toddler, you had a newborn, you just lost your husband, you were trying yeah. to put all the pieces of your life back together. Um, what was that like? <laughs> it was a circus. <laughs> oh, Lord. Did you have people um, just constantly in and out of your house trying to... Yeah. 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 I knew that the day that Keith passed away, that there was no way that I could care for my son yeah. and keep our house up and all that. Um So starting that day, there were people in the house with us 24 hours a day until my daughter was about a month old. Okay. Or a little older than a month. So for a little over two months, um, there were people with us around the clock. And, I mean, that's a big deal because I'm super introverted, so I would prefer to not have people in my house all the time. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But, I mean, 
I knew that there was someone there to take care of Caleb. I knew that there would be food. I knew that, you know, everything would just keep moving. All those things that needed to keep moving for life to go on would keep moving. And I could sleep or I could play with Caleb or I could, you know, I could, it gave me the freedom to choose what I wanted to do and not just get stuck in survival mode as much. Um, so that helped out a lot practically. People brought meals at those two months. Like, um, we were just so incredibly taken care of. And I, I tell people constantly, like, if you do not have a community of people that you trust to take care of you like that, then you need to find some new friends now yeah. before something bad happens. <laughs> because right. Because if I hadn't had those people in my life already, we would have been stuck. And unfortunately, that's the case for most young widows. Mm -hmm. And it would just make it even more unbearable. I mean, like, how overwhelming is everything already? And then to feel completely alone, I can imagine. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. I can't. I can't even imagine. (laughs) I don't. Yeah. Um, We were so, so incredibly blessed to have those people. So you said, um, so your husband passed away in January of 2015, is that right? Yep. Okay. So it's been, I guess, about a year and a half, something like that? Yeah, Since he yeah. passed away. So what has this last year and a half been like for you and your grieving process and um, in your adjusting to new normal? What has that been like for you? Um, it's, it's been season. So we moved, we left Maryland on July 2nd of last year. So we stayed in our house for about seven months after he passed away and then moved up to Connecticut and stayed with, um, family for about a month before we moved into our house in August. And then from August till about January or February, so like a good six months, I think those were the worst. Mm. Um, Because when we lived in Maryland, we had the support system, and we still kind of had our exact same routine, except Keith wasn't there. Mm. Um, We still had our same friends that we played with in our same church, and everything was, was mostly the same except for the obvious that... Keith was gone and Libby was here. And, um, so then when I moved, I just, all of my friends that I had stayed in touch with from high school had moved away. Um, so other than my mom and my sister and my in-laws and my husband's family, um, I didn't really feel like I was coming to any relationships. Mm. Um, so it was a really, really lonely time. And just kind of not feeling sure where I fit in at all. Um, And really missing, there were many times a day (laughs) that I wondered if I'd made the wrong decision and if we should have stayed in Maryland because at least we had people there. I really regretted moving for a long time because I felt like this would never feel like home. Um, and wondered if God was doing anything to take care of me Hmm. because I knew I was doing what was best for the kids, but what was best for me. And in January, we started going to a different church, um, a much smaller church than the church I grew up in. And something just clicked there. Um, the people there, just took us in and wanted to love on us and wanted to be our friends and had kids who wanted to be friends with my kids. And not that, that people anywhere else didn't want to take care of us or be our friends, but I just felt like I just kind of like round peg square hole situation everywhere we went. And finally there was this place where I could breathe and really felt like I belonged. And ever since then, it has just been um, a really wonderful uh, opportunity to make some really new good friends and develop that community that I miss so much in Maryland. And and now it definitely feels like home. Yes. Where would you say you are today? Like you feel, you feel like you have a new normal. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the interesting things about Libby being born after Keith passed away 
and now living in this house that he never lived in with us is, um, it kind of feels like the page has turned into a new chapter Mm -hmm. and it's not that he's not part of our life because of course he is like, he's the kid's dad. He, we have so many memories with him. We talk about him all the time. Like his picture is in the kids' rooms. Um, but now we're now we're Becky and Caleb and Libby and not Keith's widow and Keith's kids. Mm, yeah. Because um, that was that was too heavy of a burden to bear for that to be part of our identity. Okay. Well, so how do you how do you incorporate Keith into the kids' lives? Like, how do you talk to them about him? Because they're very young. Mm-hmm. So, um, like, yeah, what what have you found is helpful for you and for them at this stage that, that you guys are in? Um, so it's different with both kids because Caleb was a little over, he was almost two and a half when okay. he passed away. So he definitely has some of his own memories. Um, so when he brings up a memory... I'll just, you know, we'll stop what we're doing and we'll just talk about it for a while. And, and, and for a good long time, you know, he would say, is daddy coming, going to meet us at the beach? Like, no, where is daddy? Oh, daddy's in heaven. Can we go to heaven? And so it was just so hard for him to kind of figure out what all of that meant. Um, but I just took time to answer his questions when he had them and, and talk about Keith when he needed to. And um, and even now, if we go do something, like we went to a friend's house yesterday that Caleb had been to once when he was about two, so before Keith passed away, and Libby had never been there before. So as we're pulling in the driveway, I'm saying, Caleb, you've been here before. We came with Daddy. We did, you know, we did X, Y, and Z. And so just reminding him of different memories and whatnot. Um, for Libby, she has all of the like mischievous, devious, uh, genes that Keith had. (laughs) Um, (laughs) so constantly she's hearing, you're just like your dad, like you're driving me crazy. Um, but it's fun. It's so fun to see his different, the different parts of him come out in both of the kids and be able to point them out and say, that reminds me of daddy. Yeah. And then I have pictures of Keith hung in both of the kids' bedrooms. I decided in the new house not to hang his picture anywhere else. Okay. Um, because I'm not even 30 yet, and um, I feel like God has promised that there will be a dad for these kids, that, that I'll get married again one day. And I don't ever want there to be a moment where I'm taking Keith's picture off the wall. Yeah. Because um, I don't ever want them to think that he's being replaced, because that's right. not at all what's happening. Um, so that was one thing that I was really careful about. But otherwise, I just kind of let the kids initiate the conversation and go with it and it's amazing how much easier grief is for them than it is for adults yeah these they're more accepting I think absolutely I mean Libby doesn't even know what a dad is like that's heartbreaking on the one hand on the other hand it's really helpful (laughs) yeah because it's just not an issue yet did you Uh, see um Caleb going through grief when he went after your husband passed away like we had to drive. He'd been staying with my cousins while Keith was in the hospital, and we had to drive past the hospital where Keith passed away on our way home. And Caleb goes, oh, Daddy's hospital. We're going to visit Daddy. And it was like, no, buddy. Daddy's in heaven now with Grandpa Mike. Yeah. And then I just kind of held my breath because I wasn't ready to have that conversation yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you weren't You weren't even ready to face it yourself totally. Oh, right. Yeah. And, And so he just goes, oh, hey, mom, look, there's a crane. (laughs) And so it it was just very clear from the beginning that it wasn't as complex of an issue for him. Um, And then he actually really didn't talk about Keith for the first month or so. And that was really difficult because I didn't know if he'd forgotten Mm. or I just didn't know what was going on. And then after that, 
um, after a couple months, he started opening up and we started talking more. I think that's so important to let the kids, um, I guess, yeah, like you said, let the kids initiate the Mm -hmm. conversations about grief because I feel like, you know, we lost um, two babies and the most recent one we just lost about a year ago. And Mm -hmm. my son was almost five. And so he has, you know, definitely has memories. And we had yeah. talked about, you know, we knew that Charlie was going to pass away. And so even when I was pregnant, we were, you know, trying to prepare Micah for, for that. And we kept telling him, you know, whatever you feel is okay. If you want to cry, that's okay. If you don't want to do anything, that's okay. If you, you know, don't want to talk about it, that's okay. We were trying to let him feel uh-huh. okay with whatever would be going on. We weren't sure. Uh-huh. And so um, I, I know he, my, he went home with my in-laws um you know, after he visited us at the hospital, he went home with my in-laws and he told my mother-in-law, you know, I thought about it and I think I'm just a little bit sad, but I think I'm mostly okay. (laughs) But then, you know, a a little bit later he would have like, you know, kind of waves maybe, like you said, like kind of waves of grief and and we'd have to kind of talk through it. And, um, Mm -hmm. so, but just, and of course, as the, I wanted to talk about it all the time, like, but not projecting my feelings of like, let's talk about this. On him, yeah. I feel like that would have been probably more traumatic. So just like you said, letting the kids initiate because they might not be thinking about it. And they're also not thinking about it in the same way. Like it wasn't yeah. the same kind of loss for your son as it was for you or for my yeah. son as it was for me. So, yeah. Yeah. But he was so perceptive at the same time. I would be crying and he right. would come over and he would sit with me and he would say, Mama, you miss Daddy. That's so sweet. And he would just sit with me until I was done. And then he'd say something like, okay, let's go do this now. <laughs> right, like, right. <laughs> Moment's over, let's move yeah. on. That's sweet. Um, but, yeah, he kids was are, Kids are awesome that way. Helper. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's so good. Um, if someone were to come up to you and, and say, as a Christian, I'm confused and, like, not quite sure how to handle this whole grief thing. Like, I lost a loved one. I don't know, as a Christian, what is the right way to grieve? Um, what would you tell them? Because I, th- I struggled with that. I, I thought that yeah. was, it was confusing to me. <laughs> I had to wade through those waters. They were murky. Um, I would be really proud of them for asking because I feel like a lot of people feel like they should know how to do it. Mm. And, and they feel embarrassed and inept to not know how to handle a situation. Um, but then also there is no right way to grieve. We're all just wired so differently. And... And that's true in how we grieve as well. We all have different coping mechanisms. We all need different amounts of time. There's no, you can't um, talk about grief quantitatively at all. Um, We all feel different feelings. We all need to do different things to work through the grief. But um, the two things that really come to mind are um, the first is that you have to go through it. Mm. If you try and avoid it, I try and avoided grieving after my dad passed away. I thought I was doing great. I was in complete denial, and and it'll find you. You mm. don't you don't get to avoid grief. You have to deal with it at some point, and it only gets harder the longer you've avoided dealing with it. Yeah, the only way through is through. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Um, So you have to walk through it. It's hard and it's horrible and it's terrible and it feels so yucky, but you have to go through it if you want to get to the other side. Um, And the other thing is that God's character does not change based on how you feel about him. Mm. Um, And this is something that I still have to remind myself of. Just because you feel like God is silent doesn't mean he's not there or he doesn't care. Just because you feel like God dropped the ball doesn't mean he doesn't still have a good plan that he's working on. And even now there are some things that I've been praying about that God is totally silent on. And and it, it makes me question his character. And I feel like he does keep reminding me that that he is the great I am. He is all things and he is good even when 
nothing else is good. And um, when we don't feel that way, we have to do whatever it takes to remind ourselves that one day maybe we'll feel like God is good again, but we can't. Um, you can be angry at him. You can be mad. You can be disappointed. You can tell him all these things, but none of that changes his character. Our external circumstances cannot, they don't move God's immovable character. Right. And he is not defined by how I feel about him. Yeah. So as you look back on the last year and a half and sort of look forward to where you are now and where you're headed. And um, what would you say your heart lesson is that God keeps speaking to you, something that he's using to sustain you and, and just keep you moving forward? Mm. Definitely that when you choose to live bravely, you experience freedom. Mm. And, and that doesn't mean that being brave is easy because <laughs> it's not, it never is. It wouldn't be brave if it was easy. Yeah. But that when you do the brave things, um, there are great rewards that you're missing out on when you choose to listen to fear. Mm. And yeah, that's a theme that just keeps coming around again and again. So what are the brave things for you? What have they looked like in your life? Um, there, well, I, I like to talk about that there are big, brave things and little, brave things. So Mm -hmm. like little brave would be going, I don't know if we've been invited to go somewhere and I just really don't feel like dealing with people, but I know that my kids need to get out. I know that I probably need to get out too. And so just going anyways, or, um, you know, running an errand when I feel like I would rather be really lazy. (laughs) I think those, we don't think about those in terms of courage, but I feel like they are brave because it's something you have to get done and it's not easy. Well, and grief is coloring all of that. Like grief has peppered all of your daily life. So yeah, just getting out of the house can feel pretty pretty much like a pretty great accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah. And then the big brave things. I mean, I, I bought and I sold a house mm. on my own with two small kids. Um, I did a half marathon last fall with some friends in my husband's memory. Um, was it torture? <laughs> I, it was, it was terrible. I will never do it again. <laughs> That's so funny. I actually ran a half marathon after my daughter passed away in 2012. So yeah, and so something about that, like every second of it. Yeah. For, I'll, ne- I'll never do it again. Reasons. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was emotional because he was a runner and he never got to do a marathon and he wanted to. And it was in a place where we had lived together and, um, it was sponsored by the military. And so there were a lot of triggers. Uh, but then I have an anxiety disorder and I had panic attacks for the first six miles. Um, Mm. so it was, yeah, it was pretty terrible, horrible experience, but, but I made it and I survived. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so things like that, that really are big deals. I've been on like the news programs and in the newspaper locally here. And that scares me. It is not easy to put your face in, in a public place and, and really say what's on your heart. And you don't know what's going to come if, if there's going to be rejection or acceptance or a mix of both or criticism or whatnot. So I read on your blog, I would consider this a big a big brave thing, but that you went to She Speaks and um, submitted a book proposal. Yeah. Yeah. How did that feel? So being at She Speaks, God really impressed on my heart. Like, don't you see that the last 10 to 11 years of hardship have been to shape your heart to be ready for this weekend and Mm -hmm. to be passionate about encouraging other people to live bravely? And that was really healing for me because I had just started to feel like I was a tool that God was using in other people's lives and that he wasn't really doing anything for me in my life. And, um, so that was really healing to really get that message loud and clear. And then I felt like the book proposal was like the first step into the new era of life. Um, I remember Keith and I had gone to a marriage seminar weekend thing, um, the weekend to remember. And 
And I leaned over during one of the sessions and I said, I really think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to write books and speak one day. I don't know how that's going to happen or when that's going to happen, but I just see that in my future. And he looked at me and like deadpan was like, well, then God's going to have to take me home because I don't want to be involved. Oh my word. (laughs) You're like, why did you say that? Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, it's just so true. Like it was just not his, his personality or comfort or anything. Um, to be involved in, in any sort of public anything. Um, so now it's definitely just part of like, God has opened up this opportunity to minister to people with my story because Keith's not here and I wouldn't be able to do a lot of the things that I'm doing if he were, yeah. um, both because of his own comfort level and, and whatnot, but also because he had a really demanding job and I wouldn't have the time. Um, to do a lot of the things that I'm doing. But yeah, going to She Speaks was a big, brave thing. I was so nauseous on the drive to the airport. Like, I was so incredibly nervous. And uh, it was crazy. But it was really good. I hope to be able to go there one day. I actually watched the, they had Lisa Turker uh, speak live. Yeah, Yeah, and so I was listening to that. And um, I loved it. Like, what, what she said was just so good yeah it was a really I look forward to going back um it was a really incredible weekend just so much support and encouragement and wanting everyone wanting to see everyone else succeed Mm -hmm. and um yeah it's really hard to put into words but it was really incredible well, I realize that if I start saving money now, maybe by next summer I'll get to be able to go. <laughs> so that's yeah. my plan. That's my plan. I have a little envelope in my sock drawer, and I'm not. I'm actually yeah. not kidding. <laughs> oh, so. I think that's great. I think it's awesome. It's it's so worth it. So yeah. worth it. And to be able to, I'm part of Hope Writers. It's an okay. online writers community. Yeah, and I, li- I like to listen to their podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's just like a taste of what the whole community is like. It's really incredible. Well, Becky, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. And um, I applaud you for doing the small brave things and the big brave things. And I think that so many people are going to be encouraged by your story. And um, I'm really grateful that you're following the Lord's leading and um, not letting fear stop you. So thank you so much for that. Thanks so much, Sarah. I hope you were encouraged by my conversation with Becky. I hope that if you're going through a season of grief that you were able to find some really practical tips on how to walk that journey. I think one of my favorite things that she talked about was her advice um, to somebody who's going through a season of grief about the fact that you, A, cannot rush grief. You have to just go through it. The only way through is through, and it's kind of a miserable journey, but it's so important to allow yourself to take the time to do that. Um, And then she said, the second thing to keep in mind is that God is not going to change um, even if your feelings toward him right now are changing or are different than how you used to, to view him. And that's just so good to be honest like that and to just know that Um, God's character is not going to move even when your circumstances are just moving all over the place and they're uncomfortable and shifting and um, you find yourself just not feeling like you used to, but God does not change. And I think those two things are just so incredibly helpful when you're walking through a season of grief. Definitely take the time this week to um, head to sarahrickey.com and find the show notes for this podcast. You'll be able to find links to um, all of Becky's social media places where you can follow her and learn more about her story. Um, And definitely check out her podcast, Stories of Unfolding Grace, where you're going to find a lot more encouragement and see a lot more of her um, passion to encourage others to live bravely and authentically. I just want to um, give a huge thank you to Becky for sharing for sharing her story. I know it was really emotional for her at times, and I just um, appreciate her just being so open with us. So thank you so much, Becky, for, for sharing your heart and sharing these um, really sensitive places. Um, so it was a privilege to have you share here and to be able to listen and to enter in a little bit to your to your journey and what you've been going through. And thank you again to, to you listeners. I um, love hearing from you. I love knowing that you're out there listening, and I really hope this podcast is encouraging to you. 
Um, and I just hope that at the end of every episode, you feel like you've learned something. And um, as always, I hope that you're able to come with your own heart lesson to help you draw closer to the Lord. Bye, guys. <laughs>